Hebel. Uh, he will present data-centric IoT platform for enhancing uh, traffic flow management, uh, LAMA4 model, a social engineering case study. So the second uh, presenter is uh, uh, Ryu, uh, Ryu Nishimura uh, from NICT. And uh, his title is uh, uh, IoT Sensor Network for Infrasound Monitoring. And the third present presenter is uh, Mr. Nashim Ahmed, uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. The uh, title is the, the Development of a Blockchain in Smart Grid Using IoT. So this is the first session. And uh, then session two is starting from uh, three 30 p.m. And uh, in these sessions, uh, we uh, there are one presentations uh, with two uh, speakers. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Harin, and uh, the other one is uh, Mr. Uh, Yoshimasa Gunji. And uh, he, the title is Case Report of Creating of sensor-based smart bridge with disaster, with disaster resilient distributed area communication network app applying net nav net technology in rural area in Sri Lanka. Okay, so let's start from the first speakers and I will share Okay Just a moment, please. Okay, so let's start. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Wada. Um, yes, today is a great uh, opportunity for us to gather here again after the COVID-19 pandemic has already like uh, let us some free time so that we could come here um, in Sri Lanka and uh, to enjoy the cultures over here as well as to get to get to old friends and meet new friends. Uh, my name is uh, Chaudit Aswakun. I'm from Juan Guan University. And uh, in my team, uh, we're working on the wise network, the future internet, and uh, as an engineer, I'm the electrical engineering, communication engineering, but I'm also working on the transportation engineering. And the topic I'd like to share with um, friends over here today is getting the work that consumes my life, my team's life for the past three years. Um, we've been focusing on trying to address the drama which is the name of the world, University, University in Bangkok. And uh, as probably if you have visited uh, um, Bangkok, Thailand, once at least you know that the traffic is pretty jam. So um, we're trying to see how we could um, use some of the new opportunities, technologies that we've learned in our communities over here in order to try to address some of those problems. Here's a topic that I need to share with you. Um, centric IT platform for enhancing traffic flow. Traffic obviously is not communication traffic, it's a road, um, cars traffic, and we need to manage those flows. If we approach it with the end users in the um, which means that we're trying to address not only from the viewpoint of the engineers, but from the social aspect as well. Um, we've been taken for granted in designing the approach used in our project over here from mainly two projects that um, we have uh, for the issue connecting. One is the IoT Cloud Server Tian, and the other is the Open Federation Tian to the Plus. And uh, over here, uh, we think of those know how as like uh, enablers of the technologies that allow us to connect the dots. 
we connect the dots from the other two projects that is requested for the start of some study in Thailand. One is Saturn model project. Saturn is the name of another world. It's about that world, so called wonderful. There is the acknowledgement to all of our collaborators for if we are going to address the test bed that's not only inside the laboratory vicinity, but it's a test bed that's for the whole world network. And uh, so we need permissions and authoritative uh, state enterprises, the police, the city governance office, us at the London University. So we signed a random action to work on this whole study together. We have received um, Contents brought from Toyota Mobility Foundation Japan. This is Bangkok. The area of Bangkok is like uh, 50 times 30 kilometers. It's west, north, south. Um, However, Bangkok also received a lot of traffic, it's not only from residents inside that small area, rather it has a um, continuous, continuously spanned um, resident areas all around the metropolitan area. And, uh, that would be like 16 plus uh, million people in and out. Um, having great demands uh, across this small area today. This is my area considered in the project. We've already heard two names. One is Brahma 4, the other is Saturn. Um, those are two interconnecting words. The map from the left hand side to the right hand side, that's about 15 kilometers. So you could have the machine in mind. Um, University, University it was in that region. So it was in this area and has potential um, in the sink and the source of the traffic demand. It's a lot of traffic is try to cross this river, it's called the Japriya River, from the western side and coming. But it's the east or uh, around my university, it's a business district, a uh, central area of Bangkok, so it's a work and during the day. In the evening time, then the worst direction the traffic happens. Since there are only like a couple of not so many budgets across the river, so dams develop unavoidably and propagate upstreams to all the other areas. This is how we like it when jam develops. This is on Saturn Road. So it's the road, it's not the parking lot. The right hand side also we have a lot of motorcycles. Just like waiting for the light. Local high rise buildings. Out of the words, can be serviced by public transportations, or there are no and no public transportations ongoing, but not enough yet. Challenges are due to three problems that we over saturation compared to the supply. When we have a bottleneck, and if not managed properly, we develop into good pockets. So it's a lock it's as a loop it's inside the topological network structure. This is the goal of our project, Grammar Film Model Project. Uh, looking at ways to mitigate the condition on the network using the social engineering uh, projects and trying to combine traffic engineering 
those the IoT technology, the cloud technology, all kind of things that we already taken for granted in our community over here in Japan. Try to see how we can plan experimental trials on site, not for real, not only on paper. See the insights that can be gained. Some of those will be shared in the Japan community today. And we like to develop the management guideline and as a recommendation to all the states authorities that are responsible for managing all the traffic roads. And since we are in the academy side to the university, so we look at how we could formulate the collaboration of public private academy partnerships in learning tackling this problem by bringing technologies together. This is a feature that's going to be like soon time and time again throughout the remainder of this presentation. The three parts inside is a cloud at the center, and that is the data integration computing cloud ones using the Kubernetes. And that supports on the left hand side all the IoT sensors that we managed to install in our projects, as well as to ask for contributions if those sensors are already available by other organizations. The right hand side is all the applications that we deploy to run on real time traffic flow management. Let's focus on the source of the data. This is great because um, big opportunities, at least from our team's point of view, for now we have received we get the GPS data uh, from a collaboration with six uh, companies. We also have data that are available in the state, the public facilities, like uh, bank of metropolitan administration of the BMA, we already got some CCTV cross-circuit uh, TV streams, as well as the traffic signal light control data. But the ITEC intelligent transportation system, and that's a foundation uh, in Thailand, a non-profit foundation. They also aim to provide some of the data, the incidents data, um, real time to our project. Uh, some of the sensors we have to develop and install and make it work in our project as well. The signal control sensors at all the junctions, this scan with traffic sensors. Let's go through each of the sensors. I'm just going to show you like some pictures so we could go quickly through the availability of the sensors. Um, these are CCTV. So, um, from this uh, to that, it's about like five, six kilometers. So this is part of the network. I just capture it so that you see. Um, okay, these are the sensitive that we link into our system. This is how they look like. Not the bird eye view, so visual analytics will be a little bit difficult, but it's good for um, the traffic police uh, to see and to analyze um, in close details in strategic locations. This is at the corner of Tulangon University. We install the new camera in bird eye view, so that we able to run some video signal processing machine learning in order to, in this case, to detect the stopping car incidents on the bridge. And this is kind of like the blinded spot that um, the police will be able to see. So once we have this in place, then um, AI will alert that okay, right now maybe there's an accident happening on the bridge and police will be able to act promptly without any delay. Apart from that uh, incidence detection, we're also running the signal processing 
Again, but here yeah, for counting, counting for traffic volumes, the amount of the traffic, as well as to classify vehicle types, like it's a cars or tuk tuk, it's uh, the buses or something like that. And uh, we wanted to check that, well, those signal processing guys, they're working accurately enough for our purpose. This is another one with signal control data. Uh, over here, we're getting from main junctions and we're trying to see the uh, map shows on the x axis from midnight to another midnight, the same way. Y axis, that is the first number. First, it means like a right away, which directions get the light. So we we'll be able to see the pattern of controls, which is also important for improving the control strategies itself. And this is how it likes in the signal control box, wires, and that is our device, which we have hooked with uh, 4G. Send the network, send all the data into the infrastructure the time series database so that we'll be able to get that every second. The Python sensor, Bluetooth sensor, so um, sniffs the MAC address of the Bluetooth, which could be like an audio system inside the car. And uh, so we have timestamp. Once we know the timestamp of that MAC address, that same address comes to another timestamp at another location in space. So we calculate the travel time, or the speed. This is how we install all the sensors. Basically, we install at most of the junctions because we would like to know the details. For each hop, each link, well, it's going to be the travel time. In the end of the talk, I focus on blue and dark blue, selected areas, but, but not the remainder of the areas, uh, not enough time. We'll start with this one, the dark blue. This is the central area of all our test road network over here. It's important area because it's interesting, but practically and academically, there are two good lockets that may happen. They coupling together. Small grid lock happens first. Once it's locked, a part of the road in the small grid lock you can also trigger another larger grid lock to happen subsequently. So they are coupling. And that is also a good chance if we could prevent the small grid lock from happening, then the large grid lock would automatically be subsided. This is from the GPS data of the taxis, and we run the analytics for we watch our traffic. We see the in a small grid lock, and then we run control bytes counterclockwise from one location and then we minimize it, put it in the scale. And we uh, analyze all the speed as it's played as how much intense that word means. Well, if it's too much red, then the car stops. If it's quite light, short of the red, it means free flow. So we focus, therefore, the x axis from midnight to another midnight again. Y axis, it is the location contour clockwise direction. And we would like to see when you have like more or less all red vertically, it means the lock. Yes. Computing the length of the lock. Now, when the scores are open, 
versus when the screens are closed on the left hand and right hand side. So we able to know not only qualitatively that block happens, but when exactly it happens. What is the initial cause of that? Do you see by our own eyes as well? Not only to trust on the data. So we just survey all the area in order to confirm the small. Yes, it really happen. Let's move to the right hand side. How can we do anything about that? Well, um, information in real time to traffic is outside of the responsibility to manage and to control all the flows. We watch on um, the evening. So, this is the um, central command center which uh, we have installed our displays in there. At the point to see. But it's not enough. Just one man are you seeing the whole big picture, but um, one man has only two hands, lines, strict control. Throughout the whole network, we start 12 locations to control 13 junctions, sponsored by seven police districts in all the dots. This is how it looks like inside those um, distributed rooms, They're small ballrooms, not the big ones. So let's say I'm serious. It's a traffic mess that we have trained in order to seem to understand and make use of the information. This is at the display. So what we show to the traffic police? We show what time CCTV streams for all some important traffic directions. We show the incidents list. The incident happened, when, where. We show the signal control of not only responsible junctions, but all the meaningful junctions, so that we will be able to do some coordination strategies that we could work together. Show the map, as well as some of the outputs from travel time the census. It's not enough still. If you want to deliver the technology to the end users, you have to them. This is my team, and we uh, can start with the traffic list. We call that knowledge management session. Uh, in fact, the expertise is in doing all the stuff very much belonging to their domains, the traffic police domain, which took them information. After all these English management sessions, which last for about two years, we standardized the procedure and print the manual. And this is going to be the manual which shows on the left hand side the map picture. In the morning, what flows direction you have to prioritize. In the evening, what other flows you have to do. And you have to do it inside the whole team, seeing the big elephant as with an elephant together. So I compare elephant to traffic flow, the big traffic flow. The, what troubling events you should focus on to change from phase number one to phase number two, phase number two to phase number five? And what is the formula? for circulating those phase sequences. So this would just be like a list of events that we have to take a look. Once we have put the in place, is it improved? 
So this is based on four months of the social experimental trial results from November last year to February earlier this year. Before installation of traffic volume, during the installation in the same January and the everything already completed. And then we complete the validation of the phases of the traffic signal, right? Which are abnormal phases. Abnormal phases are the so called phases that the police are forced to use. Some incidents happen, like uh, kids spilling back from the downstream, so they're not allowed to go in all the possible non conflicting directions. So, you have to use like some partially allowable phases instead. So, we just record that from our IT sensor data, and then we'll be able to see that if we compare before installation versus during the installation. Well, not much improved, basically. Um, but after everything completed, then eleven percent improved. So it means that the traffic police are much less likely forced to open some abnormal faces during the rush hours. We also try to run in some computer simulation, like digital twin stuff. This is the only one. This is a simulation that we run microscopic in that same area. But now we repeat the whole thing inside the cloud. But we will be able to study and to repeat that um, with much more convenience in much faster way. That study for this accurate traffic data given in the volume versus without accurate traffic data given in the room, then what would be the jam links that happen on the road? What would be the mean variable speed? of the cards that could be seen. And uh, we compare in both the small gridlock loop one and the large gridlock loop. One. From our computer simulation, we predict that the power of real-time and accurate traffic information given to those responsible for management of the traffic flows will benefit for 30% improvement, up to 67% improvement. And the AI that we have implemented in order to um, simulate the decisions of the traffic police based on the um, the agent deterministic the policy gradient, which is just one of the um, the agent um, on that thing that we have developed. The last and I need to show over here the rightmost area. The rightmost area there is a small bottleneck that could be developed into a grid lock as well, as we have seen in this map. Lock will happen in a very strange way because there will be uh, traffic coming along this area, which I am moving here, turn right over here, take the turn, turn, and then coming back like that. What kind of vehicles would flow from here, taking that right turn, 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 turn left, and coming to the same location that it used to be? Is the minibus taxis is public transportation. So we analyze that and then we try to see well, what is the root cause of that bottleneck. And we have found that it's people crossing the street, crossing the force. But let's show the window, shall we? On the left hand side. 
something about it. So you could observe that one people, two people, another two people. So they just keep walking across the street. Even randomly. Right. The problem actually is very simple. On the right hand side, and looking at it, zoom in a bit. To tidy those behaviors by having like 12 flat men and just continue crossing all together and put the top of race in the middle, try to make things very smooth. So the solution actually is very straightforward. And very simple, and that's good because they would like to find this kind of simple measure that can be implemented very easily that will be overlooked. It's benefits. So you just install a lot of sensors all around, put in the place, and that's a the result. Part of the box. Pedestrians crossing the street in bigger group signs. And as a result, from the three hours during the evening rush hour, the total crossing time is reduced by 23%. Understandable. Because from that, the number flows. Has increased by 10%. At the highest speed of 8%. So now we have quantitative evidence, not only qualitative one, in order to prove that simple measure like that actually works. And it doesn't cost anything much at all. So having the data, I think that is a good decision making point. It's in conclusion, from our um, experiences in this project, three years that our team has been working on, is a good technological opportunities. We have proved that it's possible, feasible for the large scale, cost effective development. We have investigated one system architecture that works with the automation combined traffic engineering, IoT, cloud, big data analytics together, and we provide the quantitative such experimental results in order to confirm that by having the enhancement effectiveness for the real-time traffic flow management is possible. Thank you very much. Do you have any comments and questions for this presentation? Oh, okay. uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, it would seem that the system is always on the verge of a chaotic state. Um, do you adjust the traffic, the traffic light signal timing dynamically based on the flow rates that you're picking up? So, um, are you also so it, in Singapore they use a social engineering technique for the mass, mass rapid transport system where they'll randomly divide people to send them to the most appropriate station to avoid congestion at a particular time are you using any sort of application for feedback to the drivers to push them to a direct flow that you wish to yeah, that could enhance the stability of the path. Right. 
um, I think there is a yeah ongoing uh, work that's around that uh, advanced traveler information system. Yes, by giving uh, important information, for example, real time availability of the parking lot. Okay. So that cars do not need to like uh, late, like shop around to go to where they want to park. You can go there, park as quickly as possible, and go doing whatever uh, that they want in that area. And uh, as for the um, real time detour, uh, when congestion occurs, I think that uh, the private sectors, uh, like a navigator, companies, they have already done that. So are you feeding into things like Apple Maps, Google Maps, Waze dynamically, or are they still separate and maybe pulling out of your systems in a different way? Uh, at this moment, not yet, because uh, data has borders, uh, ownerships. And so the data that we have collected, we would like to make it open. But if the private companies would like to get something out of it, then maybe we have to negotiate something yep. so that they give something back, giving in terms of like data exchange or something like that. Well, it's always good to fund your continuing research as well by doing that. Right. Um, so what are the inflection points for those phase changes? Um, you mentioned that there were kind of various phases throughout the day and the police will adjust the, you know, for a particular phase. Could I, how much notice do you have in terms of like how much for notice do you have in terms of that, that phase change requirement? That's quite complicated. And uh, it depends from one junction to another junction. Yes. Um, but from the from the knowledge management manuals, um, mostly they will look at like a upstream uh, queue length, building up downstream queue length to see if they can let it go, real time upstream occupancy to see if the remaining queue is still like a lot that they have to try to, to throw it out, something like that. But uh, Wider area incidences are also important, like uh, gridlock about the happening or not, something like that. I think that uh, I think you've already answered my how do you perform social engineering for the drivers. I think you've already answered that. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you. Is there any questions and comments? Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, one thing I would like, uh, you talked about the Bluetooth, use of the Bluetooth uh, of a car uh, for the signal for the processing. What happens uh, and what is the statistics that people will be using the Bluetooth, keeping their on while driving? Uh, and second, any other sensors that you have placed on the roads other than the car and other things? I would like to know about that. Right. right. Um, there's a lot of sensors. Uh, Bluetooth is one of them. Um, we have collected the amount of the uh, uh, detectable uh, MAC addresses, but not we, we have not analyzed on like the penetration rate of uh, a cars to contribute to to the uh, Bluetooth sensing uh, data just yet. Because it is wireless and it's a little bit. Um, it to, it would yeah. maybe the require some permission to if we are accessing my Bluetooth device MAC address. Obviously, that may require uh, permissions and then maybe. Right. Right. Next, uh, 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 privacy uh, data protection act. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's we have to abide by. Yeah. Abide by. Yes. Thank you. Right. Right. Just a last question. Um, you, I don't think you did mention there was a permission model required for actually gathering that Bluetooth data. You're just doing it. How long do you actually keep that data after you've um, processed it? Is it stored forever or what, what, what sort of, oh yeah, when do you delete it? Uh, um, first of all, at this moment, it's trial, so we would like to keep it as long as possible um, without deleting it. 
Um, but with the uh, uh, condition on like using for educational and uh, uh, not releasing it out to the public just yet, right? So, um, uh, so over that condition, it is pretty okay. But if we would need to release that, maybe secondary uh, uh, data after we have already analyzed it or something like that, but not the raw data. Are you looking at using that data for any other crime management? So I could presume that you know a crime could be reported, that Bluetooth address could be identified within an area. The police could be using that to track a suspect in real time. Uh, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, and has anyone actually hacked your system by using Bluetooth techniques to adjust things? Luckily, as far as I know, um, not yet. <laughs> so, mm, yes. yes. So you've just raised a challenge for us for our next APEN meeting in, in Bangkok. <laughs> right, right. And yes, uh, if uh, you have some suggestion, like in order to like harden, hardening the system a little bit, yeah, okay. I would love to learn. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay, so the time is a little bit pushing, so <laughs> let's move to the next speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh. So the next speaker is Ryo Nishimura. So uh, he's a virtually representative. So if you are ready to present, please start. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Oh. Please start. Okay. Uh, hello, I am Ryo Kimishimura uh, from National uh, Institute of uh, Information and Communication Technology. Uh, it is a great honor to uh, introduce my research topic about infrasound to you at APAN's 56. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to uh, session chair for giving me, me this opportunity. I also apologize for this uh, remote presentation from a hotel room. I am now on a business trip in Japan. Uh, my sound quality may be a bad uh, due to reverberation, or something another reason. Another reason. I hope uh, that is it will be uh, acceptable to you. Uh, today I will talk about IoT sensor network for infrasound monitoring. Uh, this is outline of my talk. As an introduction, I will begin with the fundamental of infrasound to those uh, who are not familiar with it. Then uh, we will see devices uh, for infrasound measurement, uh, which include uh, not only conventional ones, but also a newly developed miniature microphone. After that, uh, I would like to show an ongoing attempt to build an infrasound sensor network. I will also demonstrate an application example of it. That is direction of arrival estimation using infrasound signals captured by the sensor network. Uh, finally, I will give some concluding remarks. What is infrasound? Sound is called differently as its frequency changes. Humans can uh, hear sound within a frequency range from 20 Hz to 20 kHz. Sound in this uh, frequency range is called audible sound. If sound frequency is higher than this region, it is called ultrasound. Ultrasound has been already used in several applications, such as sensing inside a human body or detecting an object around a car. On the other hand, sound of a frequency lower than the human audible range is called infrasound. 
Such sound has wavelengths of a range from a few dozen meters to hundreds of kilometers. And therefore, it is not easy to generate infrasound artificially. A strong natural phenomenon such as volcanic explosive eruptions, thunders, and tsunamis can sometimes generate infrasound. They all may result in a natural disaster. And therefore, it is considered that monitoring infrasound would be useful for early detection of natural disasters. Japanese people have experienced an example of its potential just 12 years ago when Great East a Japan earthquake happened. The waveform shown on this slide indicates the atmospheric pressure observed at Mizusawa Observatory. Earthquake occurred at 5.45 in coordinate universal time. Soon after that, high frequency pressure fluctuation was observed. This is considered a result of surface vibration of the ground due to seismic waves. Approximately 30 minutes later, tsunami arrived at Ofunato, which is a port town here. During this time period, uh, there was a large fluctuation in pressure, as indicated by the red circle on the slide. This is considered infrasound generated by the swell of the sea surface at the origin of the tsunami. It is noteworthy that the infrasound arrived uh, approximately 15 minutes earlier than the arrival of tsunami. And therefore, if the relationship uh, between infrasound and tsunami has been well investigated, we might be able to predict the arrival time and the scale of tsunami more accurately. To capture infrasound signals, we need to use suitable measurement devices. We can use microphones to capture audible sound. What about infrasound? For this low frequency region, we can use a microphone especially designed for infrasound. As the frequency goes lower, microphones lose their sensitivity and we need to use pressure sensors. There are two problems here. The first problem is that there is a gap in available frequency range between pressure sensors and infrasound microphones. The second problem is that, in general, the wider the available frequency range becomes, the more expensive the sensor is. It may pose an obstacle in constructing an IoT sensor network because the number of sensors is an important factor for IoT sensor network. As they say, described in the previous slide, there are not so many sensor devices available for infrasound measurement. Most of them have been developed for scientific research. A different from microphones, pressure sensors directly measure atmospheric pressure itself. Infrasound is considered as its AC components, and therefore it is important to discriminate infrasound from the pressure variation caused by the weather. We can do it by estimating its traveling speed because infrasound travels at the speed of sound. To do that, we need to deploy multiple sensors spatially distributed. In this respect, MEMS pressure sensors can be a promising solution because it is small and inexpensive. However, it is usually realized at the sacrifice of its achievable precision. This table shows the specifications of the sensor devices presented in the previous slide. The first three columns are those for the microphones, and 
Uh, there are two currents uh, for pressure sensors. In general, microphones have higher precision, uh, but a narrower measurable range in both pressure amplitude and frequency band. MEMS sensors have larger self noise level than other sensor devices. However, we think that it is acceptable for infrasound sensing because ambient noise is usually larger than this level, although it depends on frequency. This slide shows some examples of MEMS pressure sensors commercially available at present. Its accuracy is not good as microbarometers. Microbarometer is a general term to represent barometric pressure sensors having both high frequency and high precision. Infrasound is a signal of time variation in atmospheric pressure. And in this case, what is important is not accuracy, but precision. In this respect, MEMS sensors can be acceptable for infrasound sensing because its precision is almost less than one pascal. I would like to uh, introduce a new microphone categorized here. It has been recently developed by a Japanese company called Rion, exploiting a technique originally used for manufacturing hearing aids. It has two models depending on its sensitivity so that it can cover the wide dynamic range of infrasound. This slide shows results of comparison test with EK type 4964, which is a 1 fourth inch typical infrasound microphone. The upper panel is the original result where we can see that uh, there are 28 decibel difference between the high and the low sensitivity models. To make it easy to compare, these three curves were normalized at 250 hertz, uh, resulting in the lower panel. From this figure, we can tell that Rion XE1L has frequency characteristics comparable to BK type 4964 within a frequency range between approximately 0.2 Hz to 3 kHz. Hence, we consider that it can be a candidate for use in an IoT sensor network for infrasound monitoring. So far, we have seen sensor devices which are suitable for IoT. Now, let's think about uh, constructing a sensor network. In fact, a global infrasound monitoring network already exists. It was constructed by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Therefore, its fundamental purpose is to detect and localize a nuclear test performed somewhere on the globe. This photograph on the right-hand side of this slide shows a typical infrasound monitoring station used there. It consists of four or more microbarometers, each of which is connected to multiple uh, perforated pipes to mitigate wind noise. As can, as can be seen, it occupies a large area on the ground, and its location should be far from interfering noise sources. Such a complicated requirement is not suitable for an IoT sensor network of domestic scale. Hence, uh, we decided to use more compact sensing systems to build a sensor network. For example, this is an infrasound monitoring package developed by Japan Weather Association. The main sensor is uh, still a microbarometer, 
it is uh, equipped with a uh, data logger to store the captured data and communication device to send it. Researchers at the Japan Weather Association deployed this equipment to some schools in Japan. It has not been well verified yet, but inference of noise can be mitigated to some extent by setting this equipment inside a building like a school. They also operate a website called Infrasound Monitoring Network where anyone can see the locations of the deployed infrasound sensors and signals captured by them. Cooperating with Japan Weather Association, some other research institutes feed their captured data to this website to make it publicly open. One of them is the uh, National Institute of Information and Communication Technology which de deployed uh, their monitoring systems in Kagoshima, Tokyo, and Miyagi prefectures in Japan. Infrasound data observed at five locations in Miyagi prefecture are available at the website. Other than National Institute of Information and Communication Technology, Kochi University of Technology and the University of Tokyo also feed their obtained data to this website. So please uh, visit there if you have an interest. Uh, this is an example of the infrasound data captured by this monitoring network on 15th January 2022, when Tonga submarine volcano erupted. The upper panels show infrasound data observed by our sensor devices deployed in the three prefectures that are previously mentioned. The lower panels show the time delay of arrivals between all the pairs of observation points for each prefecture, are calculated based on the cross correlation. You can see that the time delay of arrival kept constant uh, for a while after the first arrival of infrasound. It means that the infrasound uh, coming from a single direction lasted for a couple of hours. In order to estimate the direction of arrival and sound speed simultaneously, we construct a system of equations for time delay of arrival, considering the geometry of sensors shown in this slide. In this slide, only one pair of sensors is considered, and therefore only one equation can be derived. We can consider all the pairs of available sensors to construct a system of equations. This is a possible formulation to estimate the direction of arrival and the sound speed. They are respectively represented by a theta and c in this slide. And therefore, vector x is the unknown parameter to estimate. Other parameters are obtained from the sensor geometry and the observed infrasound signals. Uh, this uh, formulation is considered as a minimization program with a single constraint. As you know, there is a well-known approach to solve this type of optimization problem. Uh, that is the method of Lagrange multipliers. The problem here is the constraint is not a linear equation. If it were a linear equation, a closed form solution would be obtained. However, it's a second order equation in this case. Fortunately, a two unknown parameters can be simultaneously cancelled as shown in this slide. As a result, a closed form solution can be obtained as pre presented in this slide. This is an example of applying this algorithm to infrasound signals captured by the infrasound monitoring network. 
Estimation of the direction of arrival and sound speed were conducted for each prefecture individually. The right bottom features uh, display the estimation results. Uh, traveling speed and the direction of arrival. When the estimates of direction of arrival are visualized as Adimas lines on the map, uh, we can see that they are directing towards the location of the volcano, approximately 8,000 kilometers away from Japan. Finally, I would like to give some concluding remarks. In this talk, uh, we overviewed infrasound monitoring. To the future, further research and development will be needed on the topics listed in this slide. Advanced uh, technologies for IoT will expand available locations for installing infrasound sensors. Signal processing plays an important role to achieve reliable estimation regardless of environmental conditions. Of course, uh, cooperation with many researchers in various areas would be necessary to make a uh, new information source uh, uh, will be a bit, uh, necessary to make infrasound further usable. I hope that infrasound will be available as a new information source uh, for a practical disaster management in the near future. That's all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Nishimura san. Is there any questions or comments? Uh, Thank you uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, there's a one question, uh, one observ observation or one, uh, like I can say, just uh, looking forward for the idea that actually the sound is usually detected by its pattern. It's a, a symmetric pattern. And obviously, in the infrastructure, uh, sorry, in the infrasound, if you are looking for a sound or for you are looking for a pattern, which is an irregular pattern. So how you can distinguish between a useful noise, I must say, or a non-useful noise. For example, uh, if you uh, mention about the tsunami uh, infrasound, obviously, whenever the next time it comes for Godbit, so obviously it may have a different pattern. You don't find have a regular pattern of it. So how you can distinguish? One may discard it as considering as a noise. And one might think that it's a voice and looking, hunting for it and grabbing it. Okay, maybe it's a useful sound. So how you are making a distinguish between a noise and a useful noise? Thank you. Thank you, your question. Uh, first of all, uh, we uh, didn't use a spectrum at this moment. Uh, we use a uh, time delay of arrival. So, it means uh, it uses uh, all uh, frequency components simultaneously. Analysis, uh, signal, uh, analysis was carried out in the time domain rather than frequency domain. So maybe as you said, uh, are, you, are you considering uh, frequency analysis may uh, give uh, more uh, helpful information, but uh, at the moment, we didn't uh, use it. <laughs> Does it answer to your question? Uh, let's rephrase my question. That uh, you are looking for uh, something that has been never been seen before. That has never been heard before. So how you can distinguish that is a useful information for you if you are just in a black box you have a lot of uh, signals coming in the infrared and you don't know which pattern you have to detect each of the pattern can be useful and each of the pattern cannot be useful that is the my question uh, for example you are more uh, obviously interested in sight in that point uh, if i want to train my noise obviously it's a uh, as a as a symmetric pattern so you first give it and then try to hunt for it pattern and then you identify this is the Mr. XYZ is speaking, or this is the particular noise. But in the infrared noise, you haven't heard it anything. So 
just i'm interesting to know that, yeah, that if you have a, some algorithm with you if you have a, some logic that in your mind that this out of this infinite possibilities that you are looking for a one possibility how that's i'm oh. just to know well uh we are uh estimating not only uh we use uh, multiple uh sensors to uh, estimate the direction of uh sound and uh, sound speed uh, simultaneously. So uh, we can uh, discriminate uh, useful information and others by uh, which uh, location the sound coming from and uh, how fast uh, it is traveling. Infrasound travels at the speed of sound, but uh, other uh, signals, uh, such as uh, noise signals, uh, has a different sound speed, uh, traveling speed. So we can uh, distinguish uh, them using such information. This question is your alignment of the infrastructure and recordings that you have obtained or that others have obtained. That could be fit to a more predictive model based on the uh, spectral analysis. Uh, sorry, uh, the sound quality is uh, quite bad, and uh, I couldn't uh, catch uh, what uh, you were saying. Maybe uh, other uh, you use when you use uh, other uh, microphone, uh, sound quality uh, becomes different. Can you do that? of the sounds that you have captured uh, that maybe we could use for future spectral analysis to determine the cause of the event. Your question is uh, use uh, if uh, we use a uh, sound spectrum uh, it will help to determine the uh, cause of the sound is it right perhaps someone more fluent in japanese might be able to translate for me okay. So you you were considering this using some library? Is your library? Are you making the recordings available for others to do analysis on the future? Ah, uh, so sorry. So so sorry. The data being collected will be available online for other users. Ah, uh, yes, be... yes, yes. So. このデータ自体は他の人たちに共有したりするんですかね。あ、えっと、あの、先ほどお話したように、あのウェブサイトで、はい、シェアをしてます。あ、いえ、そう、そうです。ディスデータコレクティブデータイズオープンエンドシェア
thank you sir uh, i am nasim nasim ahmed from bang from bangladesh university and engineering technology uh, i am a masters student here doing masters uh, so here is my presentation development of in, in smart grid using iot uh, first of all project of block distributed energy uh, renewable uh, and iot has given rise the possibility of decentralized energy trading market this presents opportunities for prosumers and consumers to engage in peer to peer energy exchange in this paper we propose uh, a design for blockchain based p2p energy trading in a smart grid our system is around single phase grid connected uh, smart grid that pro, uh, delivers 220 volt and 50 hertz output we utilize iot and blockchain technologies to facilitate energy trading the inverter is designed using the sinusoidal pass with modulation technique and grid connectivity is established through phase control technique the inverter section is implemented uh, in matlab while the iot and blockchain section are developing using the python uh, programming language the main contribution of this paper blockchain based p2p energy trading private p2p network implementing proof of work consensus algorithm registration of participating iot nodes using grid connected inverters fed microgrid architecture now system design uh, grid connected inverter grid integration grid topology multi inverter support with passion and blockchain now the grid connected inverter section is designed uh, first of all there uh, there is a uh, performing pll phase lock loop to get the uh, grid angle then uh, dynamically uh, sinusoidal pulse pulse wind modulation sample table generation which is fed to the hb circuit then lc filter uh, after filtering we uh, we have to adjust a, a modulation index and finally we synchronize uh inverter voltage and grid voltage and on the right hand side we get the inverter voltage which is totally identical at that time to the grid voltage now grid integration we use phase control technique and novel technique uh, where active power and passive power we can transfer from our inverter uh we use phase control technique so that if in, in order to uh, transfer active power we have to change the angle between inverter voltage and the grid voltage and in order to uh, supply the reactive power then we have to uh, change the magnitude of uh, inverter voltage and grid voltage in the right hand side grid is taking 5 ampere when the our inverter is uh, generating 10 amperes 5 amperes for its own load and the another 5 amperes it's uh, transferred to the grid that's why there is a phase difference of 180 degree this is the grid topology as you see there is a uh, acronym of pcc this is called point of common coupling where the all the grid uh, utility grid and your inverters is connected this is grid connected inverter and uh, this is a cb uh, this is the circuit breaker and there is a uh, uh, pcc load which is taking load uh there is another uh, features of uh, called islanding which is very important in uh, smart grid area islanding is the condition in which a distributed generator continue to power a location even though the electric grid power is no longer presented islanding can be dangerous to utility workers who may not utilize their circuit is still powered ieee standard uh, states that dg should be shut down in 2 seconds after main power is cut off so basically when the uh, grid utility has been disconnected from pcc every inverter grid connected inverter should be disconnected and that means cb3 cb2 uh, cb1 cb4 should be disconnected and it's operating its own load and that is called the islanding because otherwise uh, the when the maintenance workers come to uh, maintain this pcc this is still energized because they are uh, th this is the closed circuit so that's why this is islanding feature and it should be maintained uh, strictly otherwise it is a uh, life hazard risk for utility workers 
So there are two types of islanding detection. Uh, one is uh, detection detected by utility company using fiber optic cable or power line communication uh, and IoT or supervisory control and data acquisition. And there is another technique called local detection detected by client's equipment. There are two types of local detection. One is called active, another is passive. In this math, in this uh, paper, we actually working a uh, novel uh, logistic regression based. A machine learning technique, passive island detection technique. I actually skip this one because it's uh, take long time. There is a three parameter we use frequency, rate of change of frequency and rate of change of power. Uh, in that parameter, we actually finally use the log logistic function to get the whether the grid has been failed or not. This is the IoT section. I, I work uh, in, uh, uh, in my lab, a uh, power electronics lab. Uh, here, the most important part is uh, for IoT section, <laughs> I use Atmel 32 microcontroller, which is very low cost, uh, only uh, 80 taka in here, less than $1. So, and I use the USB to TTL converter. So, this is my actually the IoT, IoT section. And this is, uh, this is actually in this uh, uh, cell combination, we actually communicate the whole uh, uh, the battery voltage current uh, power you can get that and uh, as you see in the right hand side uh, which is a uh, totally pure sine wave which is very uh, and very low thd uh, less than one percent thd voltage uh, that is very important for from electrical side point of view now there is a blockchain so we uh, made grid connected inverter grid indication and successfully identity detection. Now we, uh, and still we get the output from the inverter section. And now we need blockchain to securely communicate uh, to uh, entities, to uh, uh, inverters. So blockchain, there is, uh, there is a blocks and index, time stamp, uh, transaction list, proof of work, TBS, block hash, consensus algorithm, and nodes. Now, blocks are consist of a couple of uh, components. Index, though it is not mandatory, it is very helpful to track the block having a sequence number. So that's why index uh, is important. There is a time spam, uh, stamp in blocks that transaction data was presented when the block was created, enabling it to be encrypted. Uh, transaction, transaction or data of blockchain consists of the following key term sender, receiver, energy consumption, unit price, credit, uh, event, sale, buy. Uh, this is uh, important. Now, uh, there is a proof of work. The proof of work is a consensus algorithm used in blockchain network to verify transaction and prevent double spending in a, uh, a proof of work system minus complete to uh, solve complex mathematical puzzle. And at first minor to find the solution broadcast it to the network for verification. The solution is then added to the blockchain. So this is the process of the uh, blockchain. The puzzle must be feasible but relatively complex. And so that's why prover or the inverter nodes need a significant amount of CPUs. And in this uh, paper, we use uh, to make a block, a node must try to solve the mysterious uh, mystery of first four digit of the hashing result of string catenation of previous proof, predicted proof, and previous hash. So this string catenation of previous proof, predicted proof, and previous hash must be zero. And one important thing is that proof of work easily uh, verifiable, all the nodes, they don't need any uh, very much CPU power, but in order to get the random uh, number of proof of work, that node should uh, need C uh, CPU power, significant CPU power. Previous hash block, every block, and needs the previous block hash to create a uh, blockchain. That's actually uh, the previous hash. And it is a cryptographic hash. And uh, in, in this paper, we use uh, Python dictionary, uh, dictionary data, data structure. 
to uh, add in the uh, blockchain. And we use SHA-256 hashing algorithm. And there's a cons consensus algorithm. Um, it is uh, otherwise known as the resolving complete method of blockchain. It denotes the rules and regulation of the blockchain, the price of power unit energy, transportation loss, uh, transformer, coal loss, copper loss, demand charges, etc. discussed and coded previously before the uh, block has been created. Genesis block, first block of the blockchain is called Genesis block. It is a special block because there is a no previous block, uh, no proof of work. So this is a special block. We create, um, uh, we, it is created uh, when the algorithm has been decided. Now, finally, the nodes. Uh, here, the nodes are uh, inverters. The participant node, uh, parties are called nodes. The communication between nodes are done asymmetric encryption method. We are uh, very much, uh, each node has its own private key and public key, which ensures the transit layer security. Uh, in uh, Especially the RSA algorithm is one of the most popular method which is uh, based on prime factor method. We use these RSA algorithm methods. Every node has its own private key and public key. Public key, uh, all the other nodes are participating. Uh, nodes of blockchain nodes, it's public key, but the private key only knows that uh, particular node. Is uh, It is very famous in, 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 uh, in our daily life. Zoom, every platform we use, Every uh, uh, where use this uh, SSL encryption. This is uh, also used in blockchain, and that's why blockchain is very difficult to uh, break because every node has its own private key. So the block creation process. So first of all, we need to decide the consensus algorithm. Then we create block. After that, uh, we need the EOW proof of work. Uh, values, then we have to broadcast into the whole network. Uh, every network should verify this one. And then only then a uh, uh, new block has been added to the chain. So this is the result. Genesis block, we take random values, previous hash values one, proof of work is 100, timestamp is uh, 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 taken. And the second block, uh, inverter one is, uh, sending to the grid to the energy so it's through its messages and the uh, previous hash value is here and proof of work has very random number and the block number three is when the uh, inverter two has uh, given the message that he has stopped to energy and block number four has also generated by inverter one that uh, total amount 10 taka and duration is 60 minutes and total power are given to the grid. So, and what is the unit price? And it is it is given to the, all the uh, other uh, nodes. This is the proof of work in different iteration. Uh, as you see, it is totally random. You cannot formulate in any possible way. And that's why it's very popular in security. So the conclusion, the suggested P2P energy trading mechanism feature in novel and straightforward design. The proposed theme is friendly, open source, and has potentially to boost productivity and competitiveness. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, my this paper has already published in uh, in uh, July this this year in IEEE and which is presented in uh, 11th International Conference on Smart Grid is a flagship conference in IEEE and, and this is my uh, uh, Google Scholar page where I actually details everything. Uh, total six papers has been published in this uh, whole journey. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your presentation.
Is there any comments on questions? Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my first question is quick. Uh, have you used the Ethereum to set up uh, the blockchain? Uh, no, sir. Actually, I use very raw code. Uh, and use uh, not. Uh, I actually use the very raw code uh, rather than Ethereum. I, I have a plan to use the Ethereum in the next next couple of months i i am working for that so how you have uh, managed the ledger and uh, what are the uh, components of the ledger you maintain and uh, what are the distribution of the ledger storage in the different nodes yeah, currently i use raspberry pi and uh, use very text text uh, text format so and uh, python dictionary and json format i use this format i know it is very rudimentarily but uh, in professional level, I, I have to mention Ledger, uh, Ledger uh, International Format. But currently, I use uh, Raspberry Pi and every notes uh, 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 capture it in a text textual value. Okay. Uh, and one thing uh, I would like to hear from you that there's a concept of a blockchain that uh, in the blockchain, one node should must remain alive. Uh, because it's a distributed nature and everyone is owing the data. So uh, there's a co concept that in a distributed system or in a peer to peer or in a blockchain, one of the at least node must remain alive. But for example, uh, in the case of the grid, there is a power breakdown. Your whole of the country or whole of the system connected to the grids comes down and obviously it happens. Then how you will reinitiate any idea, any thought about that, how you then reinitiate your this uh, blockchain because uh, the data might lost and you will not be able to uh, uh, make it the resume it i must say so any idea plan, any work out for this sir uh, thank you sir it's a nice question and currently actually uh, amazon aws uh, microsoft azure uh, they are actually uh, given actual uh, very uh, very uh, very good uh, services uh, try to uh, give, give uh, services they uh, in, in actually in in raspberry pi arduino uh, iot is not still ready to blockchain because it needs uh, intensive power for every as you see in my uh, slide every single information they it is cpu intensive even the raspberry pi latest raspberry pi it's sometimes take one minute or two minute uh, very rudimentary level so they actually uh, so uh, in a blockchain uh, we we have to uh, give some servers dedicated server for that so so that we use the cpu power from that one they actually work as a node but they have the special uh, power i think uh, we need for that yes i am totally and and actually yes. uh, you have said yourself what i want uh the for the blockchain uh is does not working seems to be the uh, grid computing or the electricity problems like this uh it has a separate infrastructure to be deployed but overall, yes, yes. yes james so thank you for my side thank you thank you sir there any questions okay so it's already <laughs> past the time. So thank you very much for your good presentations.